And so this morning, as we look at verses 8 to 11, uh, we're, we're going to look at the title this morning is Dirty Dreamers and Slick Schemers in verses 8 to 11. And let's just begin by reading these verses this morning, starting in verse 8. Likewise, also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. Father, in these next few moments, we ask that your Holy Spirit would move in our midst and speak to our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would equip us to be better servants for you. Lord, I ask that you would embolden us to stand for truth and righteousness. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be bold witnesses of the gospel of Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm sure that all of us have had dreams that are extremely strange. I mean, that's kind of part of dreaming. Many times they're strange and they're odd. And I found that dreams basically fall into about three categories, okay? Some dreams are delightful. They're very delightful. You know, the next, in fact, the next time that, that you go to a seamstress, or those of you who are seamstresses, look at your sewing machine, you might remember that it's a result of a dream. So Elias Howe is the one who invented the sewing machine. He was working on developing this sewing machine. He wanted to automate the process of sewing, but he had one problem. He couldn't figure out and he couldn't see in his mind where to locate the eye on the needle properly to cause, to, to cause this thing to function properly. He was running out of money. He was about to shut down this invention and move on to something else because he just couldn't figure it out. One night, he had a dream. I don't know, maybe he ate too late. <laughs> But as he was dreaming, he, he was dreaming that he was being led to his execution for failing to design a sewing machine. And so a king of some strange, strange country had sentenced him to death because he failed to design a functioning sewing machine. And he was surrounded by guards there in his dream. And each one of those guards carried a spear like he had never seen before. And right at the tip of the spear near the point was a hole. And when he woke up, he began to think about that. And he realized instantly that the solution to his problem was to place the eye and the hole of that needle on that sewing machine toward the tip. And he went back and began working on his invention and invented the first sewing machine, and so the rest is history. But it was from a dream. Somewhere in his mind, as he was trying to think through that and figure that out, it came to him in a dream. So sometimes it can be delightful. That was something that was a very good thing for him. Dreams also, though, can be disturbing. Uh, just a few weeks before he was assassinated, President Abraham Lincoln was discussing with several of his friends that he had dreamed that he was walking through a silent White House toward the sound of someone sobbing. And when he entered the East Room, he was confronted by a sight of a coffin covered in black. And he asked the guard on duty who was there, he said, who's dead? And the soldier said, the President of the United States. And so that was a disturbing dream. I mean, it's on record that he had spoken of that to some friends. Sometimes dreams can be dangerous. Now, this is kind of lighthearted, but there's a story of a man that had a terrible nightmare, and he dreamed that all he could eat was marshmallows. And so in his dream, he's eating marshmallows, and he's obsessed with marshmallows, and he eats more and more and more marshmallows, and he's beginning to just cram as many marshmallows as he, as he can into his body. And then he wakes up, and he's holding an empty pillowcase. <laughs> but that, that could be dangerous, right? <laughs> but in all seriousness, Jude verifies the fact that dreams can, in fact, be dangerous. He declares that apostasy and apostates, in fact, are dreamers. In verse 8, we saw that, that they are dreamers. And so as we go on this morning, we're going to talk about that. Uh, apostates are they're dreamers. How are they dreamers? Well, they conjure up their own theology. It's not based in reality. They just dream up what they believe, and their theology is just a figment of their imagination. It's not based on any truth. 
They base what they believe on subjective opinion rather than objective revelation from God's word. And they base those things on their own feelings, thoughts, philosophies, and desires rather than the word of God. So they base what they believe or what they think based on their own knowledge rather than what God says. And that's very important. Whenever an apostate turns away from, from God and from the word of God, there's three characteristics we will look at this morning that you can generally watch for in their lives. And Jude lists them here this morning. Number one, they're sinfully irreverent. Apostates are sinfully irreverent. The apostate loses all reverence for things holy. And so the first one under that letter A is he defiles sexual purity. And in verse 8, it tells us that they, they are filthy dreamers who defile the flesh. And verse 8 is just another link in the chain of thought that Jude had been following since verse 3 when he used the word likewise here in verse 8. Likewise, following in this thought, along with that thought, and that refers to what he's about to say and what he had just said in verse 7, which dealt with the sexual sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And almost without exception, if you look back over the course of history of those who are apostates and who have proved themselves to be apostates, many times they get involved in sensuous sexual sin. As you think, if you were to think back over history, I don't want to think on that too much this morning, but many times those apostates, that's, that is a common thread that often unravels their quote-unquote ministries. The apostate is far more wicked than any ordinary unbeliever. And I'll say that again. They are far more wicked than any ordinary unbeliever. There's, there's many unbelievers who are outwardly good and moral people. They want to do right by people. They want to do the right thing. They want to do good. They want to help people. They're there to help people out in any, any way they can. But the apostate will so often defile the flesh. They are very, in their private life, very open, openly and outwardly uh, defiled. The apostate is very wicked. And the reason why the apostate can claim to know God but still live such a godless lifestyle is because he commits soul suicide. He kills his conscience. And he's able to do these things and think that somehow in his own heart and mind it's justified or that it doesn't matter because he has killed his own conscience. And even though he will read from the word of God and use certain words of God and claim to know Jesus and claim the power of the Holy Spirit, he denies that power and lives an opposite lifestyle. He does whatever he pleases. So the word reverence comes from the Latin word reverie, which is a compound word, which means again. And then very, which means to fear or the fear of. So the apostate loses the fear of God, and therefore he does whatever he pleases. They have no fear of God. That's how they can do what they do with a straight face and no conscience whatsoever. How can someone who claims to know God and be a, be a preacher of God and claims to have the power to heal people, and there are hundreds and hundreds of people who supposedly were healed or were to be healed, who are not healed, and they just say, well, they just don't have faith. Nobody's ever healed because nobody ever has faith, but it's never their fault. That's an apostate. They have no conscience. They will take people's money in mass, throw aside the prayers accompanying that money, and live a lavish lifestyle on the backs of people who are looking for God. They have no conscience. They have lost fear of God. They're not thinking about, nor are they concerned with, nor do they care about what God thinks about it or what the consequences may be. The apostle loses the fear of God, or the false apostle, the apostate, loses fear of God and therefore does whatever he pleases. So one of the devil's greatest weapons is sensuality and illicit sex. And we see that in our world and so just about every area of culture. If you think about the decade in which America lost her innocence, pretty much everybody agrees that it was the 1960s. If you go back and study the 60s, you'll see how there was an explosion of sexual immorality and indecency and perversion and perversity. And it's not coincidental. America is an apostate nation 
And it was the sinful 60s that led to the swinging 70s, that led to the evil 80s, that led to the nasty 90s, and so we continue on this downward spiral of immorality and social degradation. So, he is sinfully irreverent. He defies sexual purity. He also defies a supernatural authority. So, an apostate will deny the authority of God. These dreamers, it says, they despise dominion. There in verse 8. They despise dominion. The word dominion literally means authority or lordship. They despise the lordship and the authority of God. For example, we talked about a couple weeks ago in our study, a past president of a Baptist university that made this statement, and I quote, The authority... For our faith should not rest upon the Bible alone or even primarily. The simple identification of the word of God with the Bible is a grave mistake. To ascribe infallibility to the written words of the Bible is wrong. The Bible is not an absolute authority, end quote. This is by one who says he's a preacher and a teacher of the gospel and is supposed to be helping to raise up the next generation of preachers. He's an apostate. He is denying and despising the authority of God and dismissing it as nothing. These apostates, they don't believe in spiritual authority. They believe in personal autonomy. They'll use that word many times. When you try to challenge them on it, they'll immediately cry, priesthood of the believer, priesthood of the believer. Well, there is such a thing as priesthood of the believer, but it must be taken in biblical context. It's their way of, of saying that they can believe anything they want to believe without fear of repercussion or without consequence because priesthood of the believer, it's what it means to me, and I'm a priest. And they'll use these kinds of arguments. What these people end up doing is using the doctrine of priesthood of the believer to modernize the gospel, to criticize the Bible, to authorize immorality, to idolize reason, and to sterilize judgment. Well, it's priesthood of the believer. We, we can interpret it any way we see fit because we're a believer and God has made us priests. And they use that to defile the scripture and to defy supernatural authority. God has spoken in his word and he said what he means and he means what he said. There is no way to take it and somehow broadly interpret it. There are things in scripture we don't understand and that's what, when we need to admit we don't fully understand that particular, that particular thing. But we do understand plenty. We understand the doctrine of the gospel and so many other doctrines that are necessary to lead people to Jesus and for people to live a thriving life in Christ. We need to be careful about those who would say, well, you know, certain immoral things are no longer immoral because we say they're not. And we have the spiritual authority to say this because we have been made priests. He also will defame spiritual dignity. In their reverence, they'll defame spiritual dignity. These dreamers, it says, speak evil of dignities there in the end of verse 8. In the Greek language, this literally means they blaspheme glories. Blaspheme glories. In other words, they blaspheme holy things. That's what speak evil of dignities is saying there. Listen to what the, this same Baptist University president, former, said about the birth of Christ. He said, the virgin birth, and I quote, is more truth than fact. Facts are historical and mundane. Truth transcends the ages. Its status, its status as, an actual, as an actual historical fact is unimportant. Now, wait a minute. Out of one side of his mouth, he's saying it's truth, but he's saying it's historically unimportant. It's very important. If Jesus was not born of a virgin, he was not God, and his blood was not holy and righteous and pure, and he was not able to atone for sins. The virgin birth is important. This is what the same man said about the death of Christ. Quote, Jesus did not die to satisfy some abstract penalty for sin. This flies in the face of the Bible. He goes on. God is not a bookkeeper. Jesus died because people chose to kill him, end quote. These, these are people, and this ideology and theology has crept into many 
Bible colleges and universities and pulpits across the nation today. You have no hell bell, Rob Bell, who teaches that there's no hell. There's no punishment or penalty for sin. This is the only hell you'll ever know. And when you see God, then you'll know he's real and you'll repent. And so then you'll go to heaven. That is not what the Bible teaches. He is an apostate. That is wrong. Then listen to what this same man says. This former Baptist University president says about the salvation of Christ in his book. Quote, Jesus did not come to tell us how to be saved. Jesus came to tell us that we are saved. Hmm, sound like Rob Bell now, isn't he? He didn't. No, he came, out, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what the Bible says. But apostates will convolute that. Yes, you need to trust and believe in Jesus. And Jesus came to tell us about the, the fact that we were sinners, but that it's okay because he's going to make a way for us to get to heaven. Everybody's going to get there. Just do the best you can. You know, that's, that is the philosophy and theology taught in a lot of churches today. A lot of ministries that are this size, like our church, all the way up to huge international ministries who are teaching a false doctrine of salvation and people are going to hell in the name of Jesus. That's why it's important to be able to identify truth. Be careful of who you are listening to, who you are reading, who you are watching. Make sure that their, their, their gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that their doctrine is true. Before you recommend someone to anyone else, know what their doctrine is, what they believe and what they teach. And make sure that it is right. We don't want to lead people astray in the name of Jesus. In Jude, verse 9, Jude refers to some argument that Michael, the archangel, had with, the, with Satan. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. And we don't know what was said. That's not important. What's important here is what God put in his word about it, that Michael did not bring against Satan a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Why is that important? This is really an, a difficult passage. But the point is that even Michael, the archangel, who is the chief angel, the ruling angel in heaven, would not confront the devil one-on-one, -on -one, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. If Michael, the archangel, as powerful as he is, and the power that he's been given by God, thought it was important that the Lord rebuke Satan, We need to realize Satan is a very powerful being, but God is all powerful. He is more powerful than I am. He is more intelligent as far as earthly knowledge than I am, but he is less than nothing before a holy and righteous God. And I dare not take him on one-on-one. -on -one. He'll obliterate me, but the Lord rebuke him. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he'll, he'll flee from you. How do you do it? You submit to God. You let God take care of Satan. You let God take care of those things in your life that are supernatural, that are oppressing you. It is not, I tell you what to do. No, God rebuke you. God will tell you what to do. God will send you out of my life and out of my circumstance because I can't do that. Even, even Michael had that understanding. I think the part of the point Jude's making here is an angel has more respect for the devil than a lot of preachers and professors and theologians have for God. He respected the power that Satan had, and he knew that the only way to overcome it was through God. And he said to him, the Lord rebuke you. He didn't rebuke him. He didn't even rebuke him in the name of Jesus. He said, the Lord rebuke you. God will take care of you. I'm just going to do what I'm supposed to do for God. But the apostate will fly in the face of God. Will say that all you have to do is name it and claim it. They will say that you just need to stick your finger in the face of the devil and tell him to get lost. No, you need to cry out to God when you're dealing with circumstances in your life beyond your control, whether it is spiritual or physical or emotional or financial or whatever it is. Let God rebuke Satan. You submit yourself to God and God will take care of the rest. 
Let's move on to number two. They're spiritually ignorant. These dirty dreamers and slick schemers, they're spiritually ignorant. Jude refers to these, dr these dreamers here, these dirty dreamers as brute beasts in verse 10 as we move on here. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. So he speaks of them as brute beasts. The Greek word for brute is a logos. Okay, and it is, of course, ah, the, le the, the word ah the le is a, a negation of something. We think of uh, our culture as being amoral, the absence of morality. So ah and the word logos, which means word, such as the word of God, ah logos means without a word. In other words, they are ignorant of truth. They are ignorant of the word of God. They're, they are, more or less, what he's saying is they are four-legged four, four idiots who go against both revelation and reason when they talk about God. They are theological eggheads and spiritual ignoramuses. I'm just going to say it this morning. They are dangerous. We need to stay away from them. Letter A, they criticize what they don't know. It said there in verse 10, these, these speak evil of those things which they know not. They don't know what they're talking about. They speak evil of things that are good. So they, they really don't know what they're talking about. And it surprises me how many unbelieving apostate liberals call themselves theologians. They say that they're theologians, but they really know nothing about the Word of God. The word theologian is the knowledge of God. To know God. So it comes, it comes from the Greek word theos, or God, and logos, which was word, God's word. It is understanding God's word. These apostates don't know God, and they don't believe his word. They're not theologians. They, they speak evil of both God and his word, by the way. They really don't have a right to call themselves theologians. When you study the Pharisees, the thing that you'll learn about the Pharisees is they, never, they just never really did get it. They just didn't get it about who Jesus was and what he was doing and what he would, has, had come to fulfill. The reason they criticized Jesus is because they didn't know Jesus. They didn't know him personally. They didn't believe. The reason that they criticized the, to, the truth of his teachings is because they didn't know the truth. What does wrong, uh, John 8, 32 tell us? You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. They didn't know the truth. They had the way, the truth, and the life right in front of them, and they didn't get it. And I want to remind you all of some important things. There's, there's some in here who are all of my children at this point. But one day, you may become a college student, a university student. Maybe God leads you to go to seminary, Bible college, train for the ministry. We have these talks at home. This is not anything new to our children. But maybe you're watching today or maybe you've listened to this. If this is where you're heading one day, be very, very careful about where you go. And whenever you hear anyone denigrate the word of God, anyone criticizes the Bible and its truth, Anyone that says anything less than Jesus Christ is God and the only way to heaven, understand that you are listening to someone who doesn't know what they are talking about. They are false teachers. They are pseudo-theologians. They're apostate. They criticize what they don't know. They don't know the God of the Bible. Therefore, they do not recognize the truth of the Bible. They also are corrupted by what they do know. Verse 10 says, But what they know naturally, as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. So these apostates have natural knowledge, but they don't have supernatural knowledge. They're, they're like animals that live by natural instincts. They just do what comes naturally. They have, they have a natural knowledge, but not supernatural. How do you get a supernatural knowledge? You have to know Christ. You have to have Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And then when you read the Word of God, the Holy Spirit gives you knowledge and understanding and helps to mold us and make us by His Word. But if we don't have Him, all we can do is look at it as a, a, a piece, of, a historical document. 
and try to apply to it what we know naturally. And then there are those who say they know God, but they don't know God and they don't respect and honor his word. And they'll, they'll apply natural knowledge to supernatural things and they get it all wrong. They're corrupted by what they do know, which is just their natural instinct. What they say they believe is uh, determined by human investigation, philosophical speculation, not divine revelation. The psalmist said about these apostates in Psalm 73, verse 9, and then verse 11, they set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. And verse 11 says, and they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? They question the authority of God and the authority of God's word. The ultimate destiny of these apostates, by the way, is destruction. They corrupt themselves, we're told in verse 10 and the last part. They corrupt themselves. The word corrupt literally means to spoil or to destroy. It could be in any number of ways as we think about history. It could be by drinking poison in the jungle of South America, like Jim Jones and his followers. It may be in a hail of bullets and a blast of fire in Texas, like David Koresh and his followers. But they will destroy themselves. And many times, a lot of others with them. So they are spiritually ignorant. And then number three, these apostates are shamefully indulgent. Verse 11 in our text says, Woe unto them! For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. And we're going to focus on this verse here as we close this morning. He now, Jude now moves from dirty dreamers to what we're going to call the slick schemers this morning. He uses three examples. They're all found in the Old Testament. The way of an apostate is found in these people. He uses Cain. He uses Balaam and he uses Kor or Korah. And so first of all, letter A, like Cain, they distort the gospel. So what is the way of Cain? You might remember the story of Cain and Abel, the biblical account. Two brothers, they brought two offerings, presenting two beliefs, leading to two destinies ultimately. Abel was a shepherd. He brought one of his flock to God the best of his flock. Cain was a farmer. He brought some of his crop to God. This is what happened in Genesis 4, verses 4 and 5. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Now, if you think about it, there's really only one distinct difference between these two offerings. The difference was the blood. That was the main difference. That was the significant difference. Why did God accept Abel's bloody sacrifice and not Cain's self-raised sacrifice? Well, because as Hebrews 9.22, the last part says, without the shedding of blood is no remission. Abel did, did not give his sacrifice. He offered it on an altar. Cain did not offer his sacrifice on an altar. He gave it. He said, why is that significant? What he gave was fruit. And that represented what he planted, what he produced, what he plucked. In other words, his good works were represented there. The work of his labor. So learn this lesson. There are only two ways in life. There's the way of Cain. There's the way of the cross. Those are the only two ways. The way of Cain, trying to do good works, produce good works in our life, trying to atone for any bad that we may do by overcoming that with good. Or there is the blood, pleading the blood of Jesus, by faith being saved, knowing that it's all under the blood. That's a very important lesson for us to learn. So Cain represents those who reject the cross, reject the need for atonement. A quote again from this once Baptist University president, apostate. He said, quote, Jesus does not come to pay off the heavenly penalties for our sins. Jesus didn't have to die, end quote. That's an apostate. The apostate will always attack our, quote, bloody religion. 
He'll deny to his death the need for the death of Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of Dwight L. Moody, a good man of God. He was preaching one day, and one day he was preaching, and some woman heard him, and she went and wrote him a letter. And the letter said, Dear Mr. Moody, if you want to be effective, you're going to have to leave out the blood stuff. And Moody said of that, he said, quote, I determined at that moment to preach more on the blood of Jesus Christ than ever before. <laughs> said, Satan tempted me to stop preaching about the blood, and I determined in that moment I would preach the blood even more. So we're, we're not only a people of the book, we're a people of the blood. Amen. Without the blood, none of the rest of it matters. Well, because without the blood, there's no forgiveness. There's no redemption, no atonement. See, the difference between Abel and Cain is the difference between Christianity and every other religion in the world. One says we're saved by grace through faith and not of works. The others say that we're saved by works and neither grace nor faith is necessary. That really is the, the, how it breaks down. The way of Cain, the way of the cross. I'll never forget this. The old song said, the way of the cross leads home. Amen. Letter B, like Balaam, they degrade the gospel. So they had gone in the way of Cain. They ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. Now, who's Balaam? The account of Balaam is found in the book of Numbers, verses 20, or chapters 22 to 25. Balak was the king of Moab. Now, he feared the Jews. And he feared that they were about to enter Canaan and what was going to happen. And so he found a prophet named Balaam. Balak found a prophet named Balaam, okay? He tried to bribe Balaam into cursing the people of Israel. Well, Balaam had enough sense at that point to go to God. And, of course, God told him, no, you can't do that. I'm paraphrasing. You can go read it in Numbers 22 to 25. So he goes back to Balak and he tells him, I can't do that. I can't curse the people of Israel. And Balak then ups the ante. He raises the fee that he's going to pay. And so Balaam informs Balak that though he can't curse the nation of Israel, he can get them to curse themselves, more or less. He can seduce them. He said, if, if you'll th he, he said, King, if you just throw this basically a sensuous feast with a lot of beautiful Moabite girls and seduce the Israelite men into committing fornication, God will take care of the rest. If you do that, God's going to handle them. Well, that's what happened. And God slew 24,000 Israelites as a result of their sin. And listen to this. This is why. All because of the counsel of a bought and paid for prophet. There are a lot of bought and paid for teachers, theologians, preachers today that are not rightly dividing the word of truth because they're more interested in some kind of material gain than they are in preaching and teaching the truth of the gospel. You see, Balaam represents the apostates who are nothing more than hirelings. Like Balaam, they run greedily after profit. They don't seek their work as a, as, as a they don't see it as a ministry to fulfill they just see it as a way to make profit. The apostate wants it both ways. Now, he wants to run with the foxes and with the hounds. Listen, this is what he wants. Listen, he wants Bible believers to pay his salary while he writes a book that only infidels will read. That is the way of Balaam for reward. Apostate gets into religion only for what he can get out of it. And so like Balaam, he's motivated by money, he's driven by desire, and his obsession is with possessions. And he will enrich himself by telling you that you'll get rich by enriching him. So you have to watch out for these television preachers that try to get you to buy their prayer handkerchiefs or their holy water or their doomsday supplies. Watch their doctrine. You need to watch out for preachers who won't preach against certain things because it might, might offend the money people. The only preacher that's worth his salt is a preacher that will preach the truth of God's word without apology, without fear of favor. 
It's our job to declare the gospel, never to degrade the gospel. And then letter C, like Korah, or like Kor, they deny the gospel. The story of Kor, Korah in Hebrew, is found in the 16th chapter of Numbers. Korah was the cousin of Moses. Cousin of Moses. He was a prince in Israel. His sin was that he rebelled against Moses and Aaron. The reason that this cost him his life was this. <clears throat> Moses and Aaron were not just two ordinary men. Yes, they were ordinary human beings, but they had a special touch and anointing of God on them as God's leadership to the people of Israel. But Korah said that what they said and what they did was not important. You see, Moses was God's prophet, chosen of God to be a prophet. Aaron was God's priest. Both of them were a picture, a type picture of Jesus Christ. And the word for rebellion here in verse 11 is the Greek word that literally means against the word. Against the word. He rebelled against God's word. He rebelled against God's work. He rebelled against the prophetic message of the word. And he rebelled against the priestly ministry of the workers. But again, keep in mind that Moses and Aaron were pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it was an especially egregious sin in the eyes of God, because God spoke through his prophet and his priests to his people. And he was openly defying them and telling people that what they were saying was not true and not of God. And he paid for it. You know, Moses was the mediator on the mountain. Aaron was the mediator in the ministry. They both represented the one who would be the mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So Kor had looked at them and he said, you're not better than I am. Nothing that you say is any more important or different than what I say or what I think. You don't have as much authority as you think you do. And of course, I'm paraphrasing. You can go read it. I don't need what you have to say. And when a man denies his need of a savior... He denies the deity of Jesus. He's in effect saying, Jesus is no better than I am, and I don't need him any more than he needs me. It's a dangerous place to be. So what all the apostates do in the end, they tamper with the truth. They twist the truth and distort it. They turn away from the truth. The road to rebellion always dead ends in destruction. Because the destiny of denial is death. And so, as you think about this, there may be different things that, that you may think about or come to mind, but there was a terrible apostate from Texas, and he was obsessed with Jesus so much that he finally claimed himself to be the Messiah. And anytime anybody would join his group, they were relieved of their bank accounts and all of their personal possessions. And while men were forced into celibacy, he took their wives and daughters as his concubines. He claimed to be Jesus Christ, but in sinful form. He defied authority. He defiled the flesh. He spoke against spiritual glories. He even said that he was more virtuous than the first Messiah. One of his favorite sayings was, quote, what better sin, or what better sinner can know a sinner than a godly sinner? Ignoramuses, these apostates. While everyone else had to walk, he drove a beautiful black Camaro. At lengthy sessions of biblical preaching that members were required to attend twice a day, which were not rightly dividing the word of truth, he underlined his authority by impressing on them that he alone understood scriptures. Nobody else could understand it or interpret it. Always a dangerous sign and a sign of an apostate. He did a lot of egregious things. He was a dirty dreamer and a slick schemer. Though you may not be in his category, if you deny the Lord Jesus Christ and refuse to give your heart and life to him, your destiny will be the same. His name was David Koresh, leader of the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. Just one example, one of the extreme ones, but the end was no less. P. 
people who follow apostates will in the name of Jesus die and go to hell. That's the sad reality. And the thing is, many of us know people who are following false religions, false teachers, apostate preachers. And by God's grace, very lovingly, and being led by the Holy Spirit and using the power of the Holy Spirit and God's word, we need to warn them of these dangers and that they must be born again. That salvation comes by grace through faith alone because of the blood of Jesus. And so if you've not been saved, maybe you're watching or listening, maybe someone in this room, if you're not certain that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the most important thing you can ever know is that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. He came and was born of a virgin girl. He lived a perfect, sinless, holy, and righteous life. He was falsely accused. He was murdered on a cross, but willingly laid his life down there. His blood was shed and he died. And he took his life up again on the third day to defeat death and hell so you can live. Anyone who will not tell you those words is a liar. Anyone who tells you that is not necessary is a liar. Your only hope is Jesus. The world's only hope is Jesus. Be very, very aware of false teachers and apostates. Watch for the signs and warn those who follow them. And if you don't know Jesus and you've not given him your life, give him your life today and be saved by the blood of Jesus. Let's stand together with heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, we are grateful for the truth of your word and the fact that it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, that it goes right to the heart of our innermost being and exposes to us who we are before you. And Father, as we look into our hearts, may we be bold to stand against the sin of apostasy. May we not be silent when we confront it, but may we confront it with the truth of your word. And Father, may those who are deceived by it have their spiritual eyes open and their spiritual ears open that they will hear and see and understand truth and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and be saved by grace through faith. We thank you again for your precious blood. We thank you for redeeming us from our sins. We pray for those who, know, who don't know you, that even as they hear this word this morning, that they would respond to your word and be saved. Father, we ask for every believer that you would challenge us to a deeper relationship and a closer walk with you. We pray for your blessing on this time of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.